Hey, what's up, guys? It's Joey here. Welcome to the Jungle Brothers podcast. Today, Paul, myself, and Coach Dylan are having a chat about sales. Now, for the uninitiated, you might feel a little bit icky when you hear the word sales. I know that I did when I first came across it um, early on in my business life, but I quickly came to learn that it is an essential part of running a business. So for anyone that's in the fitness game, hyper-relevant. However, it's also handy, even if you're not trying to sell somebody a product or a service, it's also handy and necessary if you're trying to sell them an idea. So maybe you just want to get better at being able to influence perhaps your significant other to come around to your particular way of saying something. Uh, the techniques are really universal, super interesting chat. We talk a lot about our initial fuck-ups with sales and there were plenty and uh, they're kind of hilarious and it resulted in us being quite slow to get the ball rolling with business. These days, thankfully, we know a lot more about it. It is something that we cover in depth in our coaches intensive, which is our coaches preparation course. I'm running one this weekend and I'll probably give you a little bit of a rundown of it in the next episode. Uh, but just a little shout out to that course. If you are out there and you are thinking about dipping your toes into the world of fitness and you want to become a coach, or maybe you are already a coach or even a gym owner and you feel like you could be doing a better job, well, we would love to help. This course will help you with the foundational skill sets you need to become world-class at running a fitness business. And um, we're really happy to share this stuff and everyone that comes to the course is super stoked to go away with new perspectives and new tools to add to their kit. So in any case, if you want information on that, get at me, joey at junglebrothers.com. I hope you enjoyed today's episode on sales and sales psychology. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Hello, hello. Hello. How are you guys doing? Yeah, good. Really good. Good, thanks, brother. Yeah, yeah, Dills. Go on, tell me more about that. It's the end of the week. I know for a young coach like you, it's it's you tend to get tired at this end of the week. <laughs> no, I got tired midweek and had to take a day off on Wednesday this you week did, instead. Eh? Yeah, went home. I, I went and got a COVID test. I'm like, oh, surely I'm 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 actually sick or something. And it's like, nah, just cooked, <laughs> just cooked, just overtrained. Yeah, overtrained, under recovered. Go and have a nap. You have haven't you haven't had COVID yet, have you? Nah, nah. We thought I did. I had a throat infection, so I had a couple of days off for that, but no COVID, which means I'm still on the chopping block. <laughs> He's hoping. You're going to love it. You're going to love it. Dude, I'm, <laughs> I'm like, I can't get it now. Any week before this, yeah, we can make it work. I'm going away next week on a retreat, and I'm like, I don't want to miss that. So of course. Just can't get it for the next week at least. Is that the Praxis yes, event? Yes, it is. Yes, yes. So I think half our frigging gym's going to that now. <laughs> We got Kyron, Az, Ty, myself, Jarlath, Dan, literally half the gym. Wow. Yeah. So it'll be good. How long are you guys going for? Friday till Sunday. And but what's I'm, what's the what's the focus at it? Well, Kit Lock Lachlan was gonna be there, but he's had to pull out. So it's gonna be Tom and Soshi taking the reins and uh, it, it's a bit of everything. Uh, there'll be some mobility, some handstands work, some some flow work, all that sort of stuff. Awesome. All the good shit. Yeah, right on. Yeah, it'll be cool. Spewing. Yeah. I'm not going now. Yeah, yeah, you are. Yeah, no, I'm. I'm spewing. I'm not. not. Yeah, you yeah. are spewing. Yeah, but but me and Paulie have another one coming up soon. That's here, so we're gonna we're gonna be do doing it together. The the, uh, the Movnat one. Ah, yes. Movnat. That's coming to town. Mm. Yeah. What is that? Level one certification, or we is it will two? be level one and two certified at the end. Awesome. But it's been booked for over a year or something. <laughs> it yeah. just got pushed back. I yeah. think I booked it, didn't I? <laughs> yeah. Originally? Yeah. 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 <laughs> booked it, handed when it used to me, to and then I had to deal with it for the last year and a half. <laughs> no, but they've been pretty good. It's um, It's been tough because obviously they're based over in South Africa. So every time we... Cor- South Africa? Yeah. Okay, well, I didn't know that. Yeah. So well, at least the main guy is. Um, one. True. Yeah. Yeah. So it's been figuring out hours to pe- speak on Zoom where we're both awake or... Lots of communication, delay, reply, but a couple of weeks. You, and were on. you dealing with Erwan? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So we were dealing with each other, working things out, and then he's not coming in anymore. Instead, we've got a couple of the other local guys coming in to teach, and he'll be via correspondence on Zoom on our TVs for part of it, and then they'll take the rest of it outside and whatnot. Ah, how fascinating. Yeah. Oh, that'll be cool. It'd be cool to see how it goes having him chime in. On the digital front? Yes. Yeah, it'll be interesting. It's cool. 
got to find ways to keep moving forward, don't we? Oh, yeah, we know all about that. Movnat is, for, for people who maybe are not familiar, is uh, another one of those, like a, another kind of movement sort of, I don't know, which, it's, it's more like a primal kind of ancestral yeah, sort of thing. Yeah, it's all based around like moving with nature, yeah. more of a sense. The um, practice is a method, I suppose, yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah, it's definitely more of like be in the environment rather than be in the gym space so it's similar things to what we do but they're more about being outside and climbing climbing and jumping swimming. balancing swinging yeah, yeah. lifting yeah, T objects originally did one of their Correct. certifications didn't he absolutely yes. and then he came back and started the what was the class called <clears throat> oh i can't remember yeah fuck. what was it I can't remember some either. cool T name, some primal cool something or other. Yeah, and it was, and it <laughs> was <laughs> like something. it had yeah, it had him like climbing up and like walking along the rail, and then like like everything was like a little obstacle course mm. for yeah. adults. Yeah, it was cool, but it was um, it was also one of those hard ones for people to get into. Get the buy in in that one hour class format. Mm. Yeah, mm. I think that stuff works super cool at retreats and yeah things like that where you you got people for a period of your all workshops we'll, we'll be taking elements obviously and mixing it in with some of the our own flavor and getting it in the programming but probably not a you whole class you know what you're probably going to need to incorporate it you're probably going to need some nice big timber vault boxes oh <laughs> <laughs> hey uh, this could be i i can't wait to do it because i want to at least i want to get that piece of that branch or a bow to put on the rig i've always oh, wanted to cool. do that put a few of those for, yeah. for a phase um, I was going to say that gym up north, I feel like it's northern New South Wales, not all the way. Um, are you in touch with them? Tees might know them there, but they do classes. Like a lot of their training is are centered the around that, there. that bit our style? Probably. Top <laughs> Who hasn't? <laughs> no, <Right>. I'm joking. <laughs> a new breed? New breed movement? Maybe, yeah. Um, but yeah, when I've, I've seen their classes in the past, just videos and stuff, and their gym is set up for that. So they have the bowels or the logs all ratcheted up. Uh, and then they have them a kind of, you know, where you cut the, uh, the lower half of a log so it sits flat on the ground. And yep. their, 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 their Metcons are run balance across that, jump, 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 lift, climb, and then go around in a circuit. That's pretty funky. But That's they've got cool. a bigger warehouse. They're not in Sydney, Maine. Bigger space. Looks cool. Sydney problems. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we always found with, I mean, we could do some of that stuff here. It's tricky though, isn't it? It's tricky to incorporate... I think the, the obstacle we always had was that you can come up with a cool piece of equipment for something like like that, like mm. a rail balance. Yep. But it's hard to multi-purpose that piece of equipment for other That's things. Right. Yep. Yep. And if something be single use, like those rail balance bars we had, if it's only for that exercise, yep. it's, it's kind of... Unless you have a it's big, in needs the way. To evolve big space. Or get gone. Like, yeah. Look, yeah. We, we made the rail balance bars work, but we cut them up and use them for other things now. You can use them as parallettes or elevate them and do other stuff it's a lot more useful yeah probably going to be pretty inspired from it and try to do some crazy shit it's good yeah and squeeze it in here somehow <laughs> people will appreciate it yeah that's that's why we do it gents we're talking sales today the dirty word <laughs> the word that strikes fear in the heart of every pt or gym owner <laughs> um i thought before we rip into how it works we should talk about our context of why sales is, is important um, I know that when I came into the industry, it was, was never something actually that I had been told I needed to understand. It was only once we had opened a gym and were struggling to make ends meet and pay the rent and stuff uh, that through our business coach, which was Drew Slater at the time, I became aware, holy shit, I need to understand sales. Um, Dills, you've got a background with it. Yep. Talk to me, fellas, about why we need to know sales and, and from the perspective of someone who's running a gym or working as a PT. I think the, uh, the big one is if you've got no cash flow, you're not going to be able to have a business, right? So you can have the, the coolest concept, the best idea. The, you can even build the place and it's, it's absolutely amazing. But if you can't handle sales or have a process in place for sales, you're not going to keep the, making the money to keep the doors open. Right, and that dream just is going to go. So in that way, it becomes a completely essential aspect of running a business. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. I know when the, when I think of sales, when I kind of take my mind back to before I was, I guess, educated on it to a degree, it always made me think of like 
uh, creepy people. The Maybe car salesmen. Car salesmen, you know, slimy real estate agents. Um, you <laughs> cold, know, the, cold calls. The door to door guy. Yeah. Yeah. You were know, the door to door guy. I was the door to door guy, yes. No, I can't believe you did that. <laughs> tell us. Tell us again what. How long did you do that for? I did that for about six months and Ooh. it was the worst six months of my life. And do you do like that kind of sales? A hundred percent. You do feel sleazy. You do feel like you're doing something that is not benefiting humanity in any way. And I was selling like, I was selling like kids in the, in the essence that like supporting so kids. In, yeah, right. <laughs> I just got a van full of kids. I'm rocking up. Does anyone want to buy this kid? No, nah. like um, supporting kids <laughs> over in like other countries and stuff like that. And it just, it made me hate charity because you see the, the dirty underbelly of all that sort of stuff and how people are only usually doing it because they want to make a buck and whatnot. What, as in the, the operators of these charities? Yeah, dude. So it was me and about That's 60 crazy, other 20-year-olds who couldn't give a shit about like kids at the time, right? You're just out of high school. Maybe there's one or two people who have good intentions, but the rest of us are just there to make a dollar. And you get a bonus for every child that you like get hooked on, right? So it's like and when you say you get, you, are you selling sponsorships? Yeah, so exactly. you're finding someone who'll donate to sponsor, sponsor a child. this child, right? And was it a religious organization or no? Okay. This one wasn't, but a lot of them are, um, and a lot of them are mainly because it allows you to do it as a tax write-off. Okay, right, which is pretty screwed up. I won't mention any names, but there's one like religious one, and the 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 head of the charity lives in like a ten million dollar mansion. Okay. Right. So it's it's it is pretty pretty dirty, and I get why people can feel like that scumminess when sales is involved. Yeah. Well, I guess the important thing to point out there is when when we think of sales and we feel that kind of ickiness that's a, that, that's attached to it, it's often because where our examples in, the examples in our mind are times when someone was trying to sell us something we didn't want. Yep. Or they did it badly. Yeah. yeah, and that is, you know, that is that is stereotypically like someone that comes to your door that has no idea who you are. They're just like, hey, I'm selling, you know, whatever, bow ties. Do you need bow ties? Let me tell you why. And you're like, man, fuck off. But that friction is like, it makes you feel like sales are bad. Whereas you don't tend to think of sales as the times when you went to a shop looking for something and the person that worked there was really nice to you and they were able to find exactly what you wanted and you bought the thing and you were really happy with the new pair of jeans yeah, or the, the T-shirt and you're like, you don't think of that as a sales process, but it was just because it went smoothly. I did some presenting mm. on this to the guys the other day and I, um, the, and I stand by this, the, a good sale is a great conversation, right? Like if you're doing this well, all you're doing is having a really good conversation with someone and you're getting that banter and that relationship and that back and forth. Yeah, it makes sense. Tell me, um, because I want to get into your previous experience with it and ours too, Paulie, because I know there's some good stories there. Why is it hard though? And, and like looking at it from, you know, thinking about you presenting to the, the coaches here at Jungle Brothers. Yeah. Um, and, you know, other people in your sales experience that you've helped to mentor. Why is it that we typically have a hard time embracing it as a skill set? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, first of all, it's exactly what you said. We relate it to a negative experience because you never remember the good part of it, right? You never, like you said, when someone's done it well, you don't really think of it as having happened. So what are you going to remember when you think about it? You're going to remember the sleazy guy, that car salesman who tried to rip you off or whatever bad experiences you've had. Um, that would be number one. Two would be the fact that we have a lack of experience with it, right? we're confident on the gym floor because we know what we're doing. We've got experience. Maybe even if you're a new coach, you've probably been training for a couple of years or have some sort of passion based around that. You're not likely to have a passion based around sales if this is the industry that you're in, right? You're going to have come to this industry because of that passion. You have that experience. You don't have the experience there. You don't feel confident. You don't necessarily know what you're doing. So that's going to make it more abrupt and broken up as well. Um, the next thing is is not seeing it as important, right? Or not seeing why it's valuable. Uh, and then I guess the last one would be, oh, what was I going to say? What would the last one be? No, I'd say those are probably the main ones there. I can speak to the, um, I remember when I was fresh in the PT game and I was working at Anytime Fitness and I'd never considered sales as a skill set I needed to acquire. Yep. 
but I'm on this gym floor and I'm trying to influence someone to come and train with me and then I'm trying to sell the session to them for whatever it was I was charging, $85 for a session or something like that. But I vividly remember having conversations with someone where, you know, you might give them a free session because that was the culture. Yep. Give them a free session. How did you like it? They say, yeah, it was really good. How much does it cost to train with you? And you say, oh, it's, it's $90 an hour. And then they say, oh, that's a bit expensive. And I vividly remember responding to that with, yeah, it is a bit expensive. <laughs> yep. Yeah, it is. It, it, it is, but yeah. but I'm really good. Yeah. And like, you know, yeah. uh, you know, you'll get like you'll get heaps stronger and I can teach you some mad stuff that we didn't get to go through today. And you know, you start scrambling for like benefits. And it wasn't until I had coaching that that I realized the just the absurdity of that statement. And that was essentially me feeling inadequate. Yeah. Um, but also instead of me wanting to wanting to give a solution to this person, right? Because I'm looking at them and I'm like, I can totally help you. Like, you should let me help you. Um, but instead of me holding true to that kind of um, inspiration for this chat, I wanted to be their friend. And being their friend was showing empathy and being like, yeah, it is expensive, you know, because yep. a friend gives empathy, you know? <laughs> and then, but that results in the person going, oh, well, thanks for the free session, bye. And you're like, oh, what a shame. It didn't work out again. Um, I, I just find that really funny to look back on now because I understand the importance of it that, you know, you're on the gym floor, people coming into the gym, they want help. Like they're there for a solution. You have the solution, not always, yep. but usually. And so having an understanding of sales is your ability to see that solution come to fruition. A hundred percent, a hundred percent, right? And, and you, you've said a really good point there, right? Like, you are giving them something they need. And that's, I think, probably where a lot of the disconnect is, especially if you're a new coach. Maybe you don't have 100% faith in your product as well, right? And you're like, oh, when someone gives you an objection, you're like, oh, okay, yeah, you're right. This isn't fantastic or it is a bit expensive. The other part there is you didn't have a backup, right? You're like, I've got this one thing. I've got this one thing. If they say no to that, I'm just going to go on the fly and try and figure something out or just stand by this thing. Whereas like you should be there to service them or have an alternative or be willing to talk to them and try and figure out, hey, well, yeah, cool, it is expensive, but is there anything else that we can do to work around that or where are your priorities at the moment? Is it worthwhile for you to do this even though the cost is this? Um, take me to previous experience. Um, before we get into yours, Paulie, I want to know, I want to hear from you. I remember when... Don't. Um, I remember when we first kind of <clears throat> were in those first few years of opening the gym and, and you were transitioning over and you, was, you, know, you weren't fully in it because you're still in the film industry and there was a lot of times there where you were in a sales position, onboarding new members, doing mm. an intro program, that kind of thing. Hated it. Did you? Hated it so much. You wow. know I did. Um, no, actually I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that, that I, rem I recall that. I, yeah, and it's, you know, I'm, I'm listening to you guys talking about it and I'm just going over trying to figure out you know, take myself back there. I hated it, asking for money. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of people might be like me where um, you have a bad relationship with money or you didn't come up with money and money in your culture is a bit taboo and asking for money is just really, it is dirty. Culturally, it's embarrassing. You don't talk about money. No. So I just hated that part. Really wanted to help people. Gave away movement screens for free, like, act of good faith oh they're good they'll trust me they'll come back like yeah just could not have that conversation it was terrible it would be an awkward conversation it would rattle on way too long because i didn't know where you know where to jump in and, and and shift it to there you know and you're delaying the transaction you're delaying the transaction you lose it you don't have the the other options like what you're saying is that doesn't work and uh, you know if, yeah giving them other options um and just drowning in the in the weight of the whole thing and and not being able to see now it's clear to me i'm i'm looking at that person they've come to me now after a long time deliberating about how they want to make a personal change it takes a long time for them to get to you and when they do come in i just i can see what they they want and i know that i i want to help them and i'm trying to find a way to help them i'm not trying to think about you know the money and it's yeah it's I'm, a, I'm really far from that now but a big part of it for me at the beginning was hugely the last point that you made was 
inadequacy and not thinking you're wor- worth, worth enough because I just, you know, like I just felt that I wasn't technical enough. I didn't know enough. And um, I mentioned it yesterday, I think, with you guys. Yep. Um, if, you, if you've studied your certs and you're a new coach to the game and you haven't necessarily been training for a long time or maybe you haven't, like, been that person who's trained friends for quite a while, you know, or you've done a martial arts and you're doing a bit of strength and conditioning with your friends because you're getting into that part which led you to PT, so maybe you with jiu-jitsu or something, yeah. then what you've learned is only theory and it's theory and you've also had a change for yourself but you've never taken someone else from A to B. So you're like, I know it works for I was strong. And I guess I know the science of it but I've never actually taken someone but I'm promising them if you do this, you're going to – so it was just a bit of like um, – inexperience hadn't had the skin in the game and and that um not feeling like you were you know worth the price tag it's a really interesting piece you mentioned about not not having a good relationship with money and the yeah this thing it's very prevalent in australia for sure and you know in other parts of the world but where it is kind of taboo to talk about money in a way i remember Mm. my you know i remember my parents you know i remember my mum saying to me once Oh, you never, never ask somebody how much money they make. And, <laughs> you know, and, and I still respect that as, a, yeah. as an etiquette thing now. Mm. But it's just funny that for her, that was like a golden rule. Like, no, you never ask that. Um, you know, and like uh, money. You ask everything else. What a car do you drive? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, but, and so, you know, those little things that, we, that are just cultural for us and norms, how they affect us, say, in this, in this business setting. Mm. Where it's like, well, you have to talk about money now mm. because you, you, you're trying to sell something to this person. There's, I really like the way that it was framed. Um, and Dill's interested to hear what you think about this. With our old business coach, uh, Drew, he would talk about money having an energetic nature. And so what he was getting at was if you have a solution, which is your product or service, and this person comes to you and they're a, a good candidate for, the, for your product. So, so they have a problem and you have the solution. By them giving you money, that is an exchange of energy. And what that does is it ensures their buy-in to, to whatever the process is that you're about to take them through. But it also ensures your commitment to the process because you're like, oh, I've received this money. So now I have to do good by this person. Um, and so that is this exchange of, or it's almost like a two-way kind of energy increase where both parties then are as incentivized as possible to get the most out of it. Because the person's shelled out cash, you've received cash, so they want the value, you want to give the value. Mm. Versus when you're in that early stage where you're giving free programs to all your friends, and you know you might even give it to someone at the gym, and you're like, you know what, I don't want to charge this person $150 for a, a spreadsheet, you know, for a program, whatever, whatever you charge. So you give it to them for free. But the trade-off is, is that, 99 times out of 100, the person doesn't value the thing that you gave them because they didn't pay anything for it, so they don't do it. Plus, you didn't receive anything for it, so you're not really incentivized to follow them up. The, the, like, the end road of that is that no one gets what they came for. Yep. They don't get a solution. Your business continues to struggle. It's a, it's a failure on both fronts. So I found that as a really helpful way to view it that like actually – knowing how to sell and being able to take money from or receive money from someone for a, for a solution that you can offer them is really important to that person getting the result. Yeah, dude, I a hundred percent agree with all of that. And I mean, it's, um, it's not just for free to like, to whatever you want to charge to um, a lot of the time, if I'm, if I'm helping someone and they're, and they're new to sales and, and we go over and we talk over, all right, how much do you think your sessions are, are worth? Right. And they'll say, Oh, like $110 is what I think I'm worth. And then I'll be like, how many of your clients are you charging that? And they'll be like, oh, most of my charge $80. And I'm like, why are you doing that then? You've just said to me that you're worth this. Your client's not going to see you as worth this. They're going to have an, uh, uh, like a skewed expectation of what the value is. And they're not going to value it as much when you do bring the price up as well, right? So adding a dollar value to your service, and especially if it's, let's say, a premium service, just allows that person to have a higher buy-in and a higher expectation. And that higher expectation means that you have to bring your A-game as well. 
Talk to me about um, what were you saying to the, about the the tea thing, the sales fail. <laughs> oh, <laughs> this is a good one. Oh, look, it wasn't. I, you know, I was got. A, I think I got a pretty shitty memory. I remember um, it happening quite a few times, not specific uh, instances, but one time in the old gym, um, a lot smaller than the one we're in now, had an office, a fraction of the size of this one, and it was sitting like at the top of the stairs. And we'd often have the door open, you know, and we'd be in there. This and a hot box. You could hear everything that was going on in the gym floor, you know, and especially in the middle of the day, you could hear everything, word for word, downstairs. And um, I, I just remember uh, a few times T making a sale downstairs and you were, you were trying to teach him sales. Um, and all you could hear downstairs <laughs> was T talking for like 20 minutes <laughs> longer. <laughs> And you were like, you looked at me and were like, um, what's T doing wrong? <laughs> and I'm like, he's talking. He's like, yeah. he's, he's just talking at that person's face. Um, he came in and then you ripped into him and it was all very funny. You know, it's all very funny. And then since then it was just like always you could hear the conversations and, um, you know, you'd come up and you, you could give people direct feedback. But what that also was tough because when you're trying to learn something, like I remember when I got put in that position because at first I was comfortable group coach and you guys had to kick me into PT because I was like, I'm not ready. I think I was doing group coaching for maybe six months before you maybe do PT. And I was like, I'm not ready. Um, and you kicked me out. So when I had to make sales. Shut up, bro. Get out there. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. And yeah. And then when I was making sales on the floor, I'm like paranoid that you guys can hear every word that's going on. <laughs> that's like, Tell me more about it. Tell me. <laughs> yeah. Looking up to the office. Yeah, but it was just that silence in the gym in the middle of the day and yeah. hearing T just talking at this person nonstop, just <laughs> telling him how great we are and all the things we do. In his monotone voice. Yes. And, um, you know, it's and, and that's kind of one of the, the laws of, of sales. Yes. Is to, you know, you got to listen more. And talk less. Yeah, find out more of them, about them and talk a lot less. Um, and Don't that's all, all to your advantage, just to, to the transaction, to both people's advantage. <laughs> and, but for some reason, we want to always tell people about what we're doing. It's when you have like, we learn cool shit, right? Like there's cool exercises we're all doing on the gym floor. You learn how to do a muscle up. What do you want to do? You want to teach everyone how to do that, that muscle up, right? If you've got something you think is of value, you want to tell everyone about it. And sometimes in you trying to tell everything that you've got of value, you're not listening to what the other person has to say. You're not hearing why they've come to you. Maybe you've given them one useful thing and 20 things that they don't give a shit about, right? Instead of actually listening to what they're trying to tell you and understand how you can actually help them. Yeah, that's, that's a real principle, isn't it? Yeah. That you have to know what they want first. Yeah. And, and I think that that's, that probably speaks to that the great disdain that most people have for this idea of sales because someone has tried to sell you something that you didn't want and it just leaves you with a horrible taste in your mouth. You're like, fuck off, man. Like, I, I got no interest in you, right? Whereas if they were selling, if they knew what you wanted and then they were trying to sell you that, it would probably go a lot better. Yep. Um, yeah, so what's that? Oh, Dils, tell me about your your period, your time doing door to door. Oh, like okay. I, I, how old are you? Uh, t 28. 28. 28. So how old were you when you were doing that? Ooh, 19. 19. 19 or maybe 20. Okay, so you, yeah. you're talking like uh, 2012. Yeah, 2012, 2013. Okay, so 2012, 2013, this organization is sending out like post high school kids yep. to go and sell sponsorships yep. for, to get donations. So I sold two things. I sold the sponsorships and I sold energy. So I worked for a couple of energy companies as well. I did both was technically the same company, but you would do different ones depending on what field you were in, right? Right. So very interesting little split there. And did they give you a bunch of training? Nah, two days. Okay. Two days of training, <whistles> two days of a four hour training. And then they put us in a van with a guy slightly older than us and said, all right, we've driven you to the Blue Mountains, I think was the first place we went, go and sell sell to people and you guys just spill out of this van yep like those sentinels on the matrix <laughs> yep. and just start scouring the neighborhood <laughs> going door to door and trying yeah, to pretty get, much. get dollars yep and so you just go all right first house i'm in what do you what the fuck do you say to someone it's the middle of the day so you're getting mostly like 
retirees, I'm guessing, at that time. Or unemployed people. Right on. Yeah, especially. Great candidates. Yep. And sometimes you will go and knock door to door in housing commission as well. And you, yep. you've got to, and that's always freaking interesting. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so you'd go to this person's to this person's house in the middle of the day when they have no intention of talking to someone and knock on their door and try and convince them to listen to you for at least five minutes. And then from there to try and fork over their credit card details. Amazing. Yeah. And you weren't looking for a one-off payment. You're looking for an ongoing, like a subscription payment. Yep. Or in the case of the electricity for them to switch their electricity provider to whoever you're recommending. Okay. So basically to change something in their life that's been routine for ages. Yeah. Right. Yeah. What was the pa- what what did you guys get paid? Did you get a commission on sales? Yep. Yeah, so we'd get a base salary which was like 300 bucks a week, which is nothing, right? Um and then you're not you that bad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now that I'm working here, yeah, not that bad. <laughs> <laughs> Compared to my last job. Mm. Um but then you'd get crazy commissions. So you'd get like depending on what the product does or what you're doing, uh, my my commissions weekly were usually like a grand or two grand on a good week. Okay. Yeah. How many sales would you have to make to get a Jibo? Ten okay. in a week. Yep. Yeah, you'd probably get like $100 on a sale. Yep. Uh, so, yeah, it just depended how successful you were, depended on how much money you made. And so, uh, I guess, if you're making 10 to 20 sales in a week, what's that? that like, you're covering your hundreds of Your conversion rate, yeah. So, you, if, you're, if you're good at your job, you're making one to two sales a day. Yeah, right. Out of 10 to 30 people that you're seeing in a day. And did and, and knocking at like a hundred doors, right? Yeah. Most of them don't come to the door. Most of them tell you to fuck off. Most of them come to the Actually, door, yes. But then you get either chased off the lawn by a dog or sworn out and told to. Oh, to what's get your worst away. experience? Tell us. Getting chased by a dog. Oh, yeah. Like, a, like, like a the, the person just saw me, opened the door, and then there's like a Rottweiler or whatever. There's some sort of dog just like fuck, it's fucking hell holy shit. running. Yeah, that was terrifying. Can I ask what do you wear on assignment? Is it a uniform? Nah. Nah. Just plain clothes? Yeah. And I was a, a Polo top? teenager that didn't know how to dress. So skinny jeans and some random band t-shirt. Okay. The so it, didn't, it wasn't like a <laughs> yeah, no. uniform. I'm check, like, man. it's non, not looking super official at all. Trying to get you to fucking <laughs> yeah, give yeah, me all yeah, your yeah. bank account yeah. details. Yeah. It's fantastic. Got those little credentials that people yeah, have these I had days. The little, the little. Oh, the lanyard. The lanyard with yeah, my, mm-hmm. my photo on there. <laughs> super official. People used to come to the gym all the time. All we still the get time. them once or twice a week. Yeah, but it used to be so frequent. Not so much anymore, COVID, right? man. Yeah, COVID. you're right. You're right. Oh, I think COVID did that's, put a that's stop That's what it would that. be. Yeah, well, you know what the scary thing is? Pre-COVID, when I was in this field, it was the most successful way to sell still. To this point, it had the, the best... In that industry. In any industry. Like, well, obviously, retail's different. You don't know your conversion rate because people kept walking through the door and whatnot. But it was like compared to like radio ads, everything like that, TV ads, this was more successful. Dude, I was just sitting at the intersection the other day thinking we should knock on all these factories around here and, and have a chat with yeah, them. Yeah, because people, I mean, the majority of people find it harder to say no to a person than they do to a commercial. Well, with all the people that came in, like a good number of times we gave money. True. I used to be worse, a lot worse at saying no. Oh, well, um, I mean, it's so awkward when they come up. So awkward. You pay them to get the fuck out of here. Yeah. But that's how we bought our, um, how we ended up putting solar panels on the roof, wasn't it? Oh, I don't know that. I think it might have been. Oh, wow. Probably would have been. Yeah. Yeah. And then, yeah, yeah, I think I think it did. Yeah, he was walking the area and then gave, they basically told us, hey, this is a government rebate thing. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, sweet action. Sweet action. <laughs> 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 so anyway, so the, talking about slim, sleazy guys, um, just to the side story of the guy who sold us this this package and it's basically a finance company meeting a, a a tender that comes out from the government says that you can get a rebate so they're a finance company but guy was like five foot seven looked exactly like ricky ponting <laughs> <laughs> and t took him through the whole sale it took some time to get it done but i remember he came up into the office and we all had to sign because we were all on the lease or something and he came and what did he do? We were all signing it. It was just some conversation. It was like we were doing the deal and he's like, oh, okay, great. Yep, just sign here. Stood back. It was like, ah, oh, sweet action. <laughs> <laughs> sweet action. Yeah. And then he said it a few more times and we were like looking at each other going, is 
say this that? is dodgy. It was he getting insane. slightly oh. more sweaty as he was waiting yeah. for you guys to sign. You're like, what the fuck is sweet action? <laughs> sweet action. Yeah. Every time. Um, yeah, it was like just his general word of confirmation. Like yeah. we'd say sweet or awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, sweet action. Sweet action. I remember like we booked it in. We're like, okay, when's the installation going to happen? I'll book that for next week. Okay, sweet action. <laughs> <laughs> That's terrifying. That's some Mark Zuckerberg uh, shit right there. It was a bit Zuckish. Weird. Yeah. Um, then I remember the lady. A great sale. Great sale. Great sale, sale. Um, <laughs> the, there's the other lady who used to come in, With older ginger hair. Fucking baked things and yes. little treats and stuff. Yes, yes, yes. And she, she ended up getting a little tap and go after a while. And she used to make bank. She'd come in here with Rocky Road or something. I'd buy four of them. Yeah, she was kind of too... Sesame snaps or homemade. Yeah, and she was hard. I mean, there's... um. She walks straight into our meetings and just be like, hey, 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 hey. Yeah, and it's that same thing where you're like, oh, this is really awkward. I kind of want you to go like, yeah, I, yeah. I eat. So you got some sweet food. Okay, go on. Mm. It's 15 bucks. Get out of here kind of vibe. <laughs> um, which, again, is a very effective technique, isn't it? There's like that pressure to just to buy and you're like, whatever, be done with it. Yep. Um, and that makes me think of uh, a really good book actually on sales psychology that I actually loved just as a general book. It's a recommendation for anybody. Uh, is called Influence, The Psychology of Persuasion. Uh, really, really cool. Robert Cialdini, I believe, is the author. He wrote a follow-up to it. That wasn't quite as excellent. But he talks about all these really um, fascinating examples of sales psychology. Mm. But he talks about the classic one, which the... Uh, I can't remember what religious group it was, but they were using this technique through the 90s. Uh, it was the... Some kind of monk. Yeah, it, it might come to mind. Uh, who are the ones that always... They always have a shaved head. The Hare Krishnas. Hare Krishnas. They started this technique. They wanted to talk to people right on the street. And for a long time, they were... And this is a global effort. Yep. They're like, hey, can have you got two minutes to chat with me? And people are like, no, get out of my face. But they started this thing where they would just go up and give you a flower. And so they'd say, good afternoon, I'd like to give you this flower, that's a gift for you. And people would be like, oh, like a little flower. Like, oh, wow, thanks, man, that's cool. <laughs> and they'd be like, hey, can I talk to you for a minute? And the conversion rate due to adding in that one action of giving the flower yep. went through the roof because the, we have this psychological switch where when somebody gives us something – we feel obliged to return the gesture. So they've given you the flower, your, your return gesture is to give them your ear. Mm. And, and so then they would talk to you and they would tell you about you know, their purpose and what they do and you go, yep, 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 okay, oh, yeah, it does sound really good. Yeah, I, yeah, no, I think that is a good idea. Yeah, well, peace, I'm, I'm all about it. And then they're like, all you gotta do is buy this book and it's like a $5 book. And you're yeah. like, oh, I'll buy the fucking book. Wow. Yeah, and it was, it was like this one action that became pivotal to the success of that movement. Sweet action, you might say. <laughs> That's right. How to get the sweet action in your business life. Hey, one more story. Just on the weekend, I was in Darling Harbour, saw a tie break. And um, I was there with all the family and the kids. And a couple of ladies tap, like approached me when I was sort of sitting on the wall watching the kids and get said... In, get in line, girls. <laughs> <laughs> My wife's right there. Right. Um, and, and, and she goes, oh, hi, how are you? Um, I'm just wondering... Do you have any pain anywhere? Do you have any pain? And I was like, uh, and I could immediately see, looked him up and down. Just, I could tell I've come from a religious background. I've done outreach before cold on the street when I was young. So did my brothers. And it was a, it was a religious group. Mm. Yeah. And, um, and, they, and they saw the Islander boy. Yeah. That's easy, right. target. <laughs> easy target. Um, so, yeah. So then, you know, I... I was like, well, what's going on here? And I said, um, what do you mean by that? Right? And then I she can't. proceeded to, you know, oh, just they weren't very good at the sale. She, was, she wasn't very good at it, but this was her attempt to offer something. It was a busy area, courtyard, Tumbalong Park, and they were just walking around. And she said, well, look, yeah, we're just looking for people with pain and we just want to pray for people with, 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 who has any pains in their body. You know, and this is their in to have a conversation. And um, nothing really to learn here except that they, they failed to build rapport because from there the conversation went straight into selling her religion to me um, pretty hardcore. And I love talking about religion. 
and I held her in and I talked to her for about 20 minutes and I took pleasure at, I wasn't like taking it apart, but I was, I was being positive and, you know, she was talking about, um, you know, the fear of this and that. And I was like, just trying to spread a bit more positivity around it. And anyway, it was really enjoyable conversation. <laughs> I love those. My, <laughs> my, my Tash came up and was like, she said later, I was just saying if you wanted to be saved, you know, out of that conversation, I was like, I loved it. But it was just funny because it was on the weekend and, you know, that, that sort of stuff happens. People are cold, trying to cold sell on the street. They're still doing it. From their, their ideas. I mean, what is it? What's the group that uh, you often, that you get the young guys in white shirts with the... World Vision or something No, no, like no. That. Um, uh, oh, the Mormons. 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 Yeah. Often, yeah. often Islander boys. Yeah. Yeah. Often Amer- like American kids. Yeah. yeah. And they're like scouring the globe 24-7, like every part of the, as far as and, I can and tell. And I guess this face-to-face from what you're saying, Dylan, yeah. is very effective. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, you get a conversation. It's not like answering the phone or not answering the phone or hanging up. They're right in front of you. Well, think if they say, if they speak to 100 people in the day and one person comes through right that's yeah. one person that they've pretty much got for a lifetime so it's not a bad conversion is that the average kind of lifetime when you get someone in oh you're talking about you for, convert for the religion to your one. religion yeah. yeah yeah right that's not bad like that's okay, I'm, into the reli- I'm into the religion where do i give my credit card yeah that? exactly <laughs> <laughs> oh it was it was interesting man i remember selling um i had a business uh eco heat with 90 you remember Night train. Yeah. <laughs> and his, his father is a, f- a friend of mine who grew up in Kuma. His father was an electrician and he invented a, um, an air cooling, oh, an air system for homes and buildings that used solar energy. It was really, it's a really kind of simple product, but the idea was it, it's got a tiny little fan in it that, that draws air in the, into the beginning of this kind of chamber or this long panel. And then the air goes over an element which is heated by the sun and then it goes into your home. And so on a winter's day where your house is cold, this thing produces hot air from the sun's energy and pushes it into your home. And it costs like five cents a day for the fan to run. So it's extremely cheap and it's bringing in clean, fresh, warm air. And then it also works the reverse in summer where your house is hot, but it's cool at night. So it pumps the house with cool air at nighttime. So it's actually like, you're like, oh, it sounds fucking awesome. It's not a bad thing. No, it's a really good thing. 90, 90's like, we've got to start selling it. So I was like, all right, let's start a business. So we formed Eco Hit Sydney. And I like did a couple of um, kind of like trade shows. Not trade shows, more like um, ones where you're talking with the general public. And, mm. trying to, and I, I just remember getting myself into some situations where someone's like, yeah, come, can you come around to my house and quote on it? And I'd be like, yeah, sure. And I'd go around and like, I had no <laughs> fucking idea. Like, I couldn't even explain uh, it as well as I just did. You know, it was still all a bit abstract to me. But I also had no idea about the installation and stuff. That was 90s bit. So I go around to these people's homes and they'd be like, oh, yeah, you know, we've got this, you know, six bedrooms, three levels. And, and I'm just like, oh, yep, yep, we can do this. I think I... Take your notes. Oh, mate, I might have converted like one sale, which was, <laughs> which was that person that was going to buy no matter what. Yep. You know, that, that, <laughs> the, you know the, the 1%. Exactly. Um, but just thinking about how awkward, like speaking to your point, Paul, about being early in the gym, like early in your career, you just, you feel so out of your depth and it only takes a little bit of that, like lack of confidence or security for someone to go, I don't trust you. I'm not going to buy what it is that you're selling. Yep. Helps to know your product in, really well. Indeed. Yeah. Dude, uh, and uh, another thing is like, when I first started working at Platypus Shoes, it was so second sales job I ever did. I had a manager who was really good at what they did, right? And I tried to just do what they did. And I was like, it was so terrible. It worked so badly for me. I would try and I'm like, I'm watching this person. I'm doing everything that they're doing. Why isn't it working for me? And it was just, it was not me being genuine, right? So it was, I was picking up this person's like euphemisms, doing the sale the exact same way that they did. And that's exactly what you're talking about. The people could see the dishonesty in the way that I was trying to to talk to them about these things. They're like, you're not being yourself. I can see something's up. I'm going to assume that it's because you've got a dodgy product and I'm going to get out of here. Yeah, well, that's uh, that's kind of one of the things, isn't it? That people, like they're, they're, they're buying you as well. Yeah. Like if you're the salesperson, you have to be like, you have to seem good, not just your product, 
but they're, they've got to buy your charisma and your your sort of confidence. Yeah, and you can't just try and do what someone else does, right? Like you've, you, there's all these tools and there's all these tips and you can you can learn good ways to go about sales, but at the end of the day, you still have to do it the way that's going to work for you and where you can be genuinely yourself while doing it because otherwise people are going to be able to tell that it's not you. Can, can we talk about um, what those sort of practical elements are to a sales, the sales process? Mm-hmm. Um, do you want to take us through like what your what your kind of framework is on that? Yeah, do you mean framework of like how I go through the stages or yeah? Just well, I guess like what are those stages? Yeah, you know, and let's go from from uh, from like a PT perspective. Okay, so it's like you're in front of you're in front of a potential client. Yeah, someone that's either coming to your gym or you've been introduced to them and they're interested in training. Yeah, and yep. then yeah, step it through to where you know you you, you got them. Yep the the first point I'll make is that successful sales usually only work really well if you've got a successful backstory, right? So in, by what I mean by that is I don't mean you have to be a huge brand or anything like that, but you need to be doing your back-end stuff. You need to be on social media. You need to have some sort of form of marketing. Even if it's fresh, you need to have trust points and stuff along the way. That is a good way to start the sale off, right? If you're doing all that stuff beforehand, if you've got brand accountability and people sort of seeing you here and there that's going to make the rest of the stuff way easier because you're assuming they've seen that stuff exactly right Uh, and sometimes it will be cold and people will come in and have no idea who you are and that's fine but you want to give yourself a higher success rate by having brand awareness right I, i make that point just because same way as you can have the best product and no one will want to buy it if you're not good at sales you can have the worst products but if you're really good at sales you can sell it but if no one knows the product's there Vice versa, right? Yep. Um, any sort of sales transaction is just going to start with a conversation. A conversation is just you talking to the person, trying to get to understand what exactly they're after from you. Um, any good conversation has banter. You're building a relationship. You're, you're getting engagement from this person while also trying to listen to what their individual needs are. Uh, you don't want to ask too many questions in this stage. You more sort of just want to get the understanding of what this person is coming to you for. Like I said, if you're talking too much or if you're taking the mic away from this person and not actually listening to what they have to say, you're shooting yourself in the foot and they're not going to feel like they trust you because they don't really have a relationship or they've got no rapport with you. Um, I made the I said this to the guys the other day. It's um, when you're listening to someone, Listen to understand, don't listen to reply, right? We don't want to. I was going to say, that's my favorite quote this week. Yeah. It was really, yeah, I love that. It's a, it's a big one, right? A lot of the times when we're having conversations, we're only listening for our chance to step in and take that, that next thing that we want to say. Because whether we think of it as a fact or not, a lot of the time we want to be the one that's talking, right? Yeah. We want to express ourselves. We want to put our point across. We want to dominate the conversation in some form or other right and you're not going to learn anything and this is great for education this is great for sales this is great for life when you're listening to someone trying to get your partner to come around to an idea of yours perhaps anything right if if you if you actually or maybe you'll come around to their idea if you actually friggin listen to what they're trying to say rather than just sticking to your own point you know what i mean yeah you want to listen and you want to listen to understand not just to reply this is going to give you an understanding of what they're actually coming from and what they're trying to achieve that doesn't mean during the conversation you can't be like, oh, they mentioned, hey, man, I love jujitsu. I trained jits for years. You can still be like, oh, yeah, well, we, we actually do jujitsu here, right? But don't take the conversation over from there. Don't be like, oh, who's your favorite jujitsu fighter? Exa- Have you ever? Yeah. Exactly, right? And don't like take the mic away or stop them from speaking. Just use it to keep the conversation flowing. You can even say that. You can be like, oh, who's your jits, favorite jits player? But then let them keep the conversation going. Well, th- that's a good point. Is it relevant there that. Um Oh, uh, throughout this, and I don't want to derail you from going no, to the okay. next point, but throughout this, you have to keep in mind that it is a sales conversation. Yes. And that there is a goal in mind, yep. which is to help this person if you believe that you can. Yep, exactly right. So uh, an example of where you can derail it would be at that point to start to talk to them mm-hmm. exclusively about jujitsu. Yeah. And then you find that you've been talking about ADCC and, and favorite grappling competition for 20 minutes and we've gone so far off track to the original goal, which was to get them training. And that yeah. was me. That was probably me. I think about, I do that. I'm, I love chatting to people. 
I'm interested in everything. Paul's got an ear. And as soon as you find if there's something there, I can always find a common thread with someone. I just go down on that common thread. Because yeah. I didn't I wasn't focused on the end goal and I couldn't kind of see the context of the whole conversation and yeah. And it's so easy to fuck up. What if when they said I'm I see you guys do jitsu here, right? And then the next line was gonna be it fucked my body up. Right. Yeah. And you've yeah. just gone on about, yeah, man, we're all about that. And mm. really they're here for strength training on top of that or something else right on top boy. of that, right? And you haven't taken that second to listen because you just want to fucking butt in and say what you know, right? But um, like you said, it is, it's, it's a sales conversation and you need to remember that. You've got a, a product, you're qualifying them for that product. So this whole conversation, although it should be enjoyable for both of you because good sales are, you're using this discussion to see if you can actually help them, right? And vice versa, they're seeing if they can help you. And if you can, that's when you need to go on to the next stage. So you're listening, you're understanding where they're coming from, you're actually getting to know the person. There's a little bit of banter back and forth. They're starting to like you. You'll start to like them, hopefully, hopefully as well. And then the conversation's going to evolve, right? So you go into the next stage. You're, let's say, everything's gone swimmingly. It's gone really well. That's when you're going to be like asking them for permission to talk to them about your product or what you can do for them, asking permission to sell, right? The reason it's important to ask permission to sell rather than to just jump down their throat and be like, yeah, cool. So what we do is it's 60 bucks a week. It's here, right? That's where that sleazy feeling can come from. That's the feeling that we mentioned before that you want to avoid. If you're just jumping straight down this person's throat, they're not expecting it and it's going to feel abrupt, right? It's versus me being like, Man, now that we've had this chat, I can really understand what you're trying to achieve. You've hurt your back. This is what you've got going on. Do you want me to talk you through how I think we can help you with that and what that's going to look like, right? It's, it's evolving the conversation. It's allowing the conversation to take its next step, but it's not being abrupt or being like, this is what we're going to do. Yeah. Man, when I like started to become aware of the sales thing and did some practice with you guys and... And then you're building that awareness in the moment of the conversation and then having those sort of outcomes. It was like a freaking mind-blowing moment. It sounds so silly. It's but like magic, isn't it? It's a little bit, you know, because, yeah, you, you're trying to help them and I, it just wasn't working and I couldn't see it. And then it was like a freaking, oh, I'm, I'm that here. light bulb Cause, moment. Because I've you're heard... Like looking I, up to them, oh, the fucking hell, they want me to tell them how it works. <laughs> yes, I know. Like, oh, baby. Yeah. But even, you know, I'm very aware in the conversations that I have now because they can easily keep going, you know, um, and they've come for the help and people love to talk yep. and talk sometimes. And, um, you know, that was my downfall was yep. I'll just talk with them as long as they wanted to talk. Um, Nikki, Nikki asked they, the question well, I'm too. sorry, no, what I was right. going to say is that when you do that, and you, you ground them and, and you might, you know, close that section of the talk and and then you go to the next bit, I realise that they fully appreciate that. Yeah. And and you, that's what you're there for and you're actually doing what you're there for and that was the big satisfying bit for me. It was like, oh, they appreciate that and I really love doing it now. Yeah, it's true. Uh, it's, it's the same point and we talked on it yesterday and Nikki made the point and she's like, Oh, but the, the conversation never really goes on from there for her. It, it, she finds that people are talking to her for like an hour and it's going through that stage and she's allowing them to, to voice their opinions. Yes. But Nikki's a really caring, kind, kind person, right? Yeah. So she's not ever going to go, all right, let's get to that next stage when yeah. really she's not like helping them get to their goal if she's allowing them to just keep voicing this that the next thing all these points once you have that understanding and you you feel like you know the person it's your job and your responsibility in that position that you're in to evolve the conversation to the next piece yeah yeah and they don't appreciate it in the moment but they do eventually and you build that relationship and you're that person to them yeah it also sets the standard for some some people because some people might like to complain a bit too much as well or just want to just tell you their life story unload yeah right and it's like well that's not our relationship <laughs> even when we're doing not here, PT, motherfucker. right like yeah i'll listen to you we'll talk but we're here to fucking train <laughs> yeah so you need to uh, build that from the beginning so get that fuck credit card out of your pocket right now. <laughs> let's do this <laughs> thing <laughs> <laughs> but, you you know you always say that you've got to do it in your own way that feels good and natural yep. so you got to kind of make it your own way 
Um, how about JT though? <laughs> oh, dude, dude, he's oh. brutal. What, what did he he's say? Brutally to the guy? efficient he in his sales to, piece. No, well, he was doing PT. just in conversation. Oh, you yeah. know, from a coaching perspective and from a sales thing, it's like, yeah, what are we doing here? Okay, you've come to this. This is how it's. You know, he's very, very direct and super efficient. Yeah. Um, and that goes with him and his style. Yeah. And man, I love to see it in action. It's fucking fantastic. Yeah. Well, it gets him the clients that are after that, right? Like, and that's the, the another point we'll go probably go on to later. But not everyone's for everyone. No. JT gets the people that are meant for JT, and that's fucking fantastic. Yeah. And I mean, to your point, Paul, about like happy to talk about whatever they want to talk about, and you would you would have to say that that's like a it's a self sabotage thing in a way. It's an avoidance of absolutely yep. getting to the point, isn't yep. it? And you're like, yep. oh, let's just waffle around here so I can just delay this thing that I'm right. really uncomfortable with. Yeah. So take me to the next piece. So you've asked permission to sell. Yep. Uh, they're like, yeah, sure. Tell me how it works here. Exactly right. You've gone through it all. And then they say, uh, let me just go ask the missus. Ooh. Or, uh, uh, you know what? I don't actually think I'm going to have the time for that one now. It's the, uh, the classic objection, right? So it's them throwing up an obstacle or something in the way because they don't want to make an on-the-spot commitment. And uh, going back to... Like you said, all of this is just psychology within a sense, right? Like humans instinctively don't want to commit to anything on the spot. We're, we're made to think, and I, I love your gene story for this one, right? Like we're made to think that if someone offers something to me then and there, there's something going on instinctively, I'm going to assess and want to go back, right? So yeah, it's just, and it's the outlay of cash. Yep. I, I find... Yeah, like with the jeans thing, uh, where I, uh, that example is I've been wanting a new pair of jeans for ages because I've outgrown the ones that I got and I'm like... Booty? Uh, yeah, always. Again? Again. Those <laughs> thick-ass <laughs> thick <laughs> quads. I'm going to go buy some jeans this weekend and, and I buy a pair of jeans like once every seven years or something, right? Like, <laughs> you know, like so infrequently. And I go to, I'm like, yeah, that shop's good. I like that brand. Okay, cool. I'll, I'll go to like to I'll drive to the town or whatever and I'll go to those three shops. I got my those and I go to the first one. I'm like, hey, I'm here for a pair of jeans and I try and I cut pairs. I'm like, yeah, this one's all right. This one, not so good. Go to the other one. Yep, these are good. Oh, I really like that first one. Okay, I'll just try the third place. And then I go to the third place and, you know, whatever my experience is. But the end result is I don't buy a pair of jeans. Yep. And it's like I went to the city with cash in hand to buy a pair of jeans and I tried on multiple pairs of good jeans, yet I returned home without jeans. And it's because I was just like, oh, there could be something better out there for me. I might find something better. But the reality is you go back to work the next day and then I don't get to go buy a pair of jeans again for another seven years. You know, <laughs> you're like, like that, it seems so absurd. Whereas why didn't you just buy the jeans? Because it's what you wanted. Yep. Um, mm. So, yeah, so I, 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 it's that like resistance to like spend your cash, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it's a, we'll, fall, we'll throw up these false objections or we'll convince ourselves they're true just because we don't want to commit to anything on the spot. We want to, we want to think exactly like you said, it's the, the FOMO, right? Fear of missing out. We're like, oh, but what if there's a deal tomorrow or if I find something slightly better the next day? Or sometimes it's just, I don't want to commit to this yeah. because I know it's going to be hard work. Yeah. Right? And it's also... Well, PT in particular is a somewhat uh, premium product or a membership is is a time commitment. So it's kind of also different, I guess, for something that's smaller. Yeah. Like you just buy a block of piece of candy. But yeah, it's a bigger commitment too. Mm -hmm. It's a factor. Yeah. It is, but then you think about like you'll happily go, you know, I don't know, buy a round of drinks, cocktails with friends on a Saturday <laughs> well, night at some bar and it's a hundred bucks. You're objection handling right now, that, dude. That's exactly right. Beautiful. Which is right. the next point. <laughs> Good that. little segue, mate. Yeah. Um, and how much do those jeans cost? You? <laughs> Not as much as this gym membership, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> <laughs> which, which is where you go on to, right? Like as a person in sales and as someone who has a product that you know is going to be valuable for this person, you're trying to help this person, it is your job to help them come to the realization that whatever they've just said to you is complete bullshit in the nicest way possible, right? Like they're making up something that may have a level of truth to it, but overall is just something to, so that they don't have to say yes on the spot, right? Uh, it's, oh, I don't have the time. It's like, okay, cool. We, we're going to have a look at your calendar together. Let's see if we can book in your first session and go from there, right? 
It is your job not to ignore this could be genuine thing that they're presenting to you, but it's your job to work through with them and find a solution to this problem. Them saying, oh, this is an issue, isn't a hard yes, it's a soft no. It's, I've got this fear, can you help me fix it? Right. Yeah. And it's your opportunity then to, to prove to them that you can present them with this solution. Yeah, and it's also just helping you build on this relationship you've just built. It's like, okay, yeah, cool. I value this. I understand that this is what you're worried about. Let's figure this out together and come out of this even tighter into a relationship and into this agreement that we've formed. Interesting point because as a rookie salesperson, when you get that first objection, it's done. I, I remember this many times. Someone says, oh, I can't afford it. And you're like, oh, shit, all right. Well, you know, fuck, best of luck with it. Thanks for coming in today. You know, you're just like, because it's the first little bit of friction you feel and you're already feeling really insecure. So like that just knocked you off your mantle and yep. you're like, I'm done. But for the experienced individual, it's it's really just an opportunity for, the, for you then to reiterate why it is that you know you can help this person yeah, you've spent and what the, they've told you previously. Exactly. You've spent the last hour getting to know this person or 20 minutes or whatever it is, right? You know that this is you're doing something valuable for them. You just need to remind them of that. Remind them why they're here. You didn't go to their house. It's not door-to-door -door sales. You're not trying to force a product down their throat. They've come to you for a reason. They already see value in you. Just remind them of it. I had a... Um, we were looking at... Uh, I mean, we were looking at houses um, early, uh, mid last year and uh, we looked at this place um, in Haberfield actually, this small small kind of terracy sort of joint and um, whatever, it was, it was fine but it wasn't, you know, it was, it was actually a fucking mess. But um, as we're walking back through, the, there was an agent and he said, oh, how'd you guys go? And he was, you know, he was like a, like a little Italian Aussie guy. Like, How'd you guys go? And Suit like, was a little tight. Oh, yeah, sweaty, you know. And uh, he hadn't given us any attention like on the way through, but on the way, he said, and um, said, oh, yeah, you know, it was good. You know, thanks thanks for letting us through. And he said, um, you got many other places to look at? And responded, yeah, yeah, we, we're checking out a couple more today. And he said, let me give you a piece of advice. If you like this one, buy this one. He said, all you're going to do is go around, look at places, and then you're not going to be able to settle on something and you're not going to buy something for another two months. He said, I've seen it happen before. He said, buy this one. <laughs> and I thought, and we laughed and, you know, he said it kind of a bit tongue in cheek. But I thought it was actually a really good piece of advice. Yeah. You know, because it's like, trust me, like if you just buy this, then you don't, you don't have to stress for the next two months. You don't have to go out and look any, it's just done. And you'll make, you know, you'll, you'll find a way to love the thing. Like the person yeah. who gets the tattoo, it's like, you'll find a way to love the tattoo because it's now permanently <laughs> part of it. You know? um, but yeah, I, I, I just thought that was funny. And oh, it's, I can and, see him telling And you. sometimes well delivered, those little kind of, like almost speaking to JT's manner in a way. Uh, if you can have that little bit of confidence, it, it, I don't know, it goes a long way. Mm. It is quite influential. Yeah, yeah, it is, right? And it's just him doing it in his style. If I did that, that wouldn't work. <laughs> but um, yeah, that's him, so it works well. So how long until... You took Gladesville after uh, that guy. Were it's you a, it's you were regretting? Yeah, it's a good question. No, <laughs> in truth, we didn't look at that many places. <laughs> we actually, we made a better decision. Okay. Yeah, 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 of yeah, course. Good. Yeah. But, you know, you talk to most people when they're out looking for, and it's this yes. months, months long journey. Oh. Yeah, and it can be pretty grueling and stuff. Mm. Um, all right. So let's say you've handled the objection. What comes, what comes after that? Maybe one or two more objections, right. which is the case, like, just because, and I want to reiterate this as well, right? Because a lot of the time we'll be like, yeah, objection done. I smashed it. And then they'll hit you with the second one. And it's like, I wasn't ready for a second one. Shit, <laughs> now I've dropped the ball, right? Like, there could be a couple and that's fine. Uh, sometimes also from there, it won't be successful. And that's fine too, right? Like I said, not everyone is suited to you. Maybe that objection is genuine and you haven't convinced them that you can solve that problem as well. That's going to happen. That's okay. Let's say you're successful, that's when it comes to the close, right? So then it is when you need to convert. Juicy now. Yes, it's the give me your wallet, let's go, let's <laughs> do it now. So you're, 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 you want to keep the end process just like the rest of it, right? You want to make it as smooth as possible, keep the conversation flowing and not have any obstacles in the way because this is why we don't say, all right, come to your first session, pay me then, right? The longer between this beautiful conversation and relationship you've built, 
to the time when this person invests in you, the greater the room for doubt, right? I've loved everything you've said. I really enjoyed everything about this place. Cool. I'm going to come up next week, sign up. We'll do it all then. Yeah, cool. All right, I'll see you next week. They go home. Oh, I'm so pumped. I'm talking to my friend about this gym I found. This place is awesome. Everything they do is amazing. It's exactly what I want. Costs X amount. Oh, yeah, I, I know a gym around the corner that does all those things. It's, it's 40 bucks. Not remembering all the things that we did differently or the energy that you felt there. Uh, that, that friend hasn't had hasn't seen any value because they didn't talk yeah, to they you haven't for 20, here, right? 20 minutes they don't know at all. Products. No, they they don't know. No They're idea. just saying, oh, I've got this thing that I like and it's a little bit cheaper, so do this instead. Which is, again, someone trying to just like insert their worldview onto, onto another person because that's conversationally what we're tending to do. Exactly, right? Or maybe it's just like as time goes on, all these other responsibilities pop up. I've got the kids. I, oh, you know, I'm not going to be able to get there in time. Whatever it is, the longer between that process that's been amazing and the final commitment, the greater the chance for them to convince themselves that it's not worth it. Well, it go, that speaks to this energetic nature of money, doesn't it? Exactly right. Whereas if they've paid and it's booked in, man, that person is fully committed and yeah. whatever, on the odd occasion, you might get someone who still decides not to and asks for a refund. Yep. But for the majority of the time, people are like, no, nah, I'm in, I'm doing it. And you know, great, they're going to come in, they're going to start getting the result, you're going to be able to give you, you know, service this person. Yeah, exactly right. So you want to make that process as smooth as possible. You've got your card reader ready, you've got whatever it is, whatever your final process is, everything is there, it's ready to go. You just give it to the person and it's done, it's sorted. Then you've got this amazing relationship and you just build on it from there, right? Versus I'm not ready, I'm not prepared, I go upstairs, I've got to print something off, it takes 10 minutes, two minutes in, you're okay, Five minutes in, you're starting to get frustrated. Ten minutes in, you've left. Yeah. Right? They've got to get to a meeting. Exactly. And it's like, oh, I'll get the, the details next time. And then next time never comes. That used to be my sales process for the original Jungle Brothers outdoor classes in, in Harmony Park, Surrey Hills. Tell us, Joe. People would come to the group, have <laughs> the workout experience of their life. <laughs> All this new shit, new perspectives, amazing. You know, some would, it would usually be someone bringing a friend because we didn't really have any marketing. And... Except for you. Yeah, except, for, I mean, yeah, standing around there doing looking my Looking like a wedge. Good. Yeah, yeah I, yeah, I guess I was pretty wedged at that time. The wedginess was to come because <laughs> I hadn't started my movement training journey. Ah, okay, cool. But, um, <laughs> but the person would say, oh, that was all, like, they'd finish the workout and have to move on. Like, everyone's going to work or whatever. Like, that was so awesome. And I'd be like, great, you want to keep training? Yeah, I want to come back tomorrow. I'd love to keep training with you guys. How do I sign up? And I'd say, awesome. When you get to, when you get to work, just go to junglebrothers.com. And if you just click on the subscriptions there, you can sign up on the website. And people go, oh, okay, great. Yep, all right. And I'll be like, see you tomorrow. And they'd be like, see you. And then most of the time they wouldn't come back. <laughs> and I never knew why. And I'm like, people are just flakes, man. And then again, it wasn't until years later, we would have some sales training and I would realize... You were the flake all along. I was the fucking flake, <laughs> man. I should have had a form for them. I should have been like, these are our pricing options. Which one are you going to pick? Here's the form. You just sign it. I'll do the rest credit card details, you know, because at that time of high energy, that's where you want to capitalize on this commitment. Yeah. And yeah, just leaving the ball in their court. People are busy. They get back to the office. They forget about it. They probably have the best intentions, mm. but they just don't get around to it. Yep. Um, what a crime. What an Such absolute crime. Such a crime to us now. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I did that for years, brother. Ugh. But you know what the best thing about that story is? <laughs> What's that? You got better at it. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Or even the Tiora one, T got better at it, right? T got better. T still defies yeah. the laws Logic. of physics <laughs> because he will just talk at someone. Or not call people back or have any <laughs> accountability and people still come. Yeah. <laughs> but you still, you hear a sales chat with T and he's doing most of the talking. Yeah. Still, however, people oft usually sign up with him. What is that? I Pheromones. <laughs> I, read a <laughs> I read a thing the other day that there's a... Um, it's the, uh, what's it called? It's like a phenomenon of the founder. Mm. And it's like when a founder of a business is the salesperson, they often can, so they can break the rules because yes. they are the founder. They can sell with such charisma. Uh, they can tell the, the person about the business with such charisma that it almost defies the, the general kind of logic of sales mm. versus when you've got a person who comes in as a salesperson 
who is not a founder, they don't have that. Like they, they just they can never express the business in that same way. So they have to stick more to the rules. Yeah, I get that. Yeah, um, that makes sense. Yeah, which I, I'm like, yeah, because you know, T T is a good talker, and everything he says is genuine. Yeah, you, yeah, that's right. There's no part of what he's saying that makes you feel like he's slimy. Well, he. We also had excellent marketing. <laughs> <laughs> he, yeah, and uh, and I guess um, he would. Um, <laughs> hey T, we're talking about you. Oh, well, you're not here. Um, he would also be in that category of um, building a future in someone's head because he always talks about the vision and the greater, bigger picture. And I know that's part, in part, to do with trying to convince someone and motivate someone, right, is to build that image of that place or what we're trying to do here, you know, and be part of our bigger thing, come with us and fight this battle. But, yeah, I totally get that. He. He just breaks the rules, but it works. He's good at it. He's good at it. Mm. Um, that's it in terms of the steps, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, that's a pretty good base explanation. Can I add, mm. if we went back a step, because yeah. the objections thing, mm-hmm. only because that one's really tough, and I know you were saying you, know, you get better with, it, with your experience and stuff, but you can also learn. There's more, there's more actually, in a, you know, we're kind of – Summarize, you can't learn everything in one podcast, but there is, you can learn more about sales, whether it's coming to one of our internships or you did some sales coaching. And I really like that, you know, there is kind of a finite amount of types of objections and yep. you can learn those and you can script those objections because the objections are really scary. And I thought I'd just let them know that you can learn scripts to help with objections. And the other one that I, the objection handling type of scenario that we've been talking about in our business development is preparation. So if yep. you think oh, I'm not a good talker, it doesn't come natural to me at all, um, but you're a good pr- preparer type of thing and knowing your product, having tiers of your product and other options is one way to hold to, to deal with an objection. So they don't want that. And you've got other options that you know really well in their pricing and how they work. And you can see the situation, the schedule, and you can put them onto something else. So I thought I'd just mention this. You can learn to be better at those objections. And use scripts and you can also just know your product better and have yep. options in your product that help you deal with it, you know, to, to filter them in other areas. Be prepared. And, and you can still help them, but it just looks a little different and you're, you're prepared for that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think the, like, one thing that comes to mind regarding objections is – if you have managed your sales conversation well, like the initial phase where you're, where you're um, seeking to understand this person and you're listening to them and prompting them with little questions, you can kind of pre-handle the objections. Okay? Like, like say you know that um, someone might want to go home and think about it and say you know that someone might object because they can't train with you three times a week. When you're in that initial conversation, you can be like, and tell me, like, are you in a position to be able to come to the gym three times a week at the moment? And if someone's like, well, yeah, I am. You're like, okay, cool. You know, and then you could ask at another point, uh, and look, are you looking to make a commitment today? Like, is this something you want to get moving on right away? So then by the time you get to that point, if that, that person's not going to say to you, I can't come to the gym three times a week, like, because they've already said to you that they can. Yep. Whereas if you didn't ask that, Classic one will be, I just don't know if I have time at the, the moment. Pre-handle. The pre-handle. Yeah. The <laughs> pre-handle. Yeah. That's the Christopher Nolan inception <laughs> level shit. <laughs> oh, the other, there's you, the, you did that in the office yesterday, the day before. With Ken. Cos is his actual name. Cos. Well, so he told me. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but yet Ken, Cos, yeah, he came into the office, old friend, jiu-jitsu friend. And... Um, when someone walks in and you're into you know, into something, sometimes it's it's disrupting your day, and you went into ultra efficient sales mode. Yeah, it was zero fat, like zero percent body fat <laughs> on this sales, <laughs> and Joe's like, okay, okay, so you're ready to go? Can you make it to the gym three times? Or you know, yeah. he was like, oh yeah, 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 and it was just all done in like two and a half minutes. Awesome. Yeah. It was yeah, it was one of those ones that went really well. Yeah. <laughs> But the, but the pre-sale is kind of what you did to me. Like, okay. Yeah, like, because, yeah, that's what right. What are we doing here? Yeah. Can you come down three times? Because you said, tell me, what do I need to do? I said, you said, can you make it three times a week to this gym? He's like, yep. And you're like, boom. You're in. It's it. Yeah. Pre-sale. Yeah, that goes, a, that goes, a, I mean, that goes a long way. I guess the other thing we should point out is when you do get an <laughs> objection, 
what is it that like, what are you tactically, what are you doing then? You're taking the facts or the things that they've said to you throughout the conversation. You're using those to reassure them of whatever their concern is and then find a solution to that concern. Right. So I say to you, oh, look, sounds really good. You've just told me the pricing and stuff and that I can start today. Um, I'm just not sure if I've got enough time for it right now. Work's kind of busy. Yeah. And so so I, I like we'll do a pretty rough example here. So it's like, look, I get it. I understand that time can be hard to find in the day between work, between family, all the other things we've got going on. But you told me how important it is for you to start addressing these issues you've got in your shoulder. Why don't we just try and book in one session for now? We'll find a time that works. We'll look at your calendar. We'll look at my calendar and we'll go from there. Hard to say no to that. Yes, right? Yeah. You're, you, you're just remind. like I said before, you're just reminding them of what they've already said is important to them, right? They're not here because they don't want to be here. They're here because there's something that you've done that's proven that that's what they're looking for. I like what you said. It's a soft yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Or it's, it's like a yes, but. Yeah. No, it's they a soft no. It's a soft Did no, you say? Yeah. No, it's, a, it's not a hard no. It's a soft, it's a soft yes. yes. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. So it's like a yes, but. Like I still want the thing, but I've got this problem. Yeah. Or i And everything or, after or but I is bullshit. So they're saying yes. They just <laughs> want to know more. <laughs> Sales God. <laughs> Pretty good spot for us to wrap it up on. Mm. Folks, if you listen to that and you do want some help with the sales piece, it's something that we run through to to quite a degree in our coaches intensive. We're actually running the coaches intensive tomorrow and the next day uh, and Dylan will be presenting the sales segment Ooh-hoo. of that. Paulie will be uh, presenting his piece on PT development. Um, awesome event. The next one, we don't have a firm date, but we're looking at sometime around June or July. So I will keep you updated here on the podcast once we lock in a date for that. Um, but yes, the big takeaway is if you are in a, in a position where you're trying to sell your services to somebody and that is anyone who owns a gym or anyone who works in fitness, PT, group thing, whatever, you've got to understand sales. The other side of it, which we didn't talk about today is marketing. And I think it'd be cool for us to catch up again, maybe in a few weeks and we can dive into a bit of a sort of our approach to the marketing puzzle. Yep. Big topic. Big yep. topic. Mm-hmm. Totally intertwined with this one though. You can't, have one successfully without the other. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, boys. Thank Good. you. Thanks, Joey. Love Thanks, it. Dills. Guys, thank you for listening today. If you enjoyed the episode, please share it with a friend. Um, and like I said, if you are interested to know more about the Coaches Intensive or anything we have going on, you can get at me directly, joey at junglebrothers.com or you can find the gym at junglebrothers.com. Thank you. We'll see you next week. Peace. <laughs>